Welcome to D-Labs Tech Tips. September 14th happens to be my birthday, so I've got a free day in the shop. Working on an Electro Harmonix MiG-50 amplifier. Came in here with some strange issues. I think I know what it is. So here we go with the tips. All right, here's the MiG-50 removed from its cabinet for initial inspection. Looks like a pretty well-built unit. Large output transformer and power transformer, pair of 6L6s, three 12AX7s. A nice, basic, clean design. Let's take a look around the back. Here we are, our backside. You can see she's labeled with Electro Harmonix. I hear, though, that these are actually made by Sobtech in the beginning. Not sure. Loudspeaker outputs for 4, 8, or 16 ohm. Bias adjustment with convenient test points and a fuse, and there's your adjustment, kind of nice. Another fuse here for the valve, as they call it. Here's your power input, and you have selectable line input switch here. All right, here we are, bottom side of the MiG-50, and yes, it is a circus board based amp. However, I'm fairly impressed with the quality of the board and the components they used. This circus board is a dual-sided, type so you got traces on top and the bottom it's very well supported and even though these are PC mount type of pots these are much better quality than what I'm seeing in say the new fender amps these are supported with a threaded shaft and a nut so when you put the knobs on it doesn't stress the pot like some of these others I've seen where there's absolutely no support a plastic shaft goes through so when you push on the knobs, it can damage the pot. So that's really nice. I like that. The other thing I like about this amp is they did use real switches for the power, right? And they used a real lamp holder, not some stupid LED going through a little hole. So all in all, it looks like a well-constructed amp. It just suffers from bad solder connections. Let me show you those. So what got me wondering is when the amp showed up, this fuse called Valve, which was a one amp GMA style fuse, was popped. But yet it wasn't like an aggressive pop, right? It's not all black. It's just that the little filament in there broke. So I thought, well, that's kind of odd. So I didn't expect to find a direct short, but I did expect to have some bad connections, maybe causing some current surges in the amp. So if we carefully inspect the board, I'll show you what I believe was causing that fault. All right, so let me show you some classic cases of bad solder connections on this circuit board. All right, so first off, let's go to the output tubes. I know this is not going to be real easy to see, but if you look right down here on V4, pin 8, see the terminal coming up? It's all cold, and you can actually see all the way around that solder connection. It's very bad. And then I go over here to the other output tube and that pin 8 is the same way. That's very strange. Why would just the pin 8's have such a lousy connection whereas the other pins are somewhat okay. They're, they're not perfect but they're better than pin 8 and that is the cathodes of the two 6L6 tubes. So that would definitely affect the current and could cause some surging in the current through the output tubes and possibly pop that fuse. So let's take a look at another bad connection in the amp and I see several of these too. Take a look at the pad here on R12 and the pad here on R11. They're pretty much dry and if you look there are traces on the top side that go to those resistors. Now these are probably flow through type of connections so if they're soldered on the bottom it's probably okay. However if you look around at the other connections you'll see that the solder flowed up on the pins like this should have. So I call these dry connections and if you look down in there you can see where the lead goes right down into the hole, right? So the solder did not flow up and over the lead like it should and there's several connections in here that are that way. So if we take a look here at R8 it's also dry on this lead 
but over here is a classic bad solder connection. I call these prostate connections because it's like a little donut with a lead going through. You guys know where I'm going with that. But this is caused by unequal heating. So the lead and the foil are not at the same temperature. So the solder pools around the lead like a donut with rosin down the center. So all these need to be addressed before I even power this amp up. So another little feature that I wanted to point out with this amp is this is the bias board. Okay, so there's the pot, there's your test points. This one ohm resistor goes through this 800 milliamp fuse to the yellow lead and that zings over here and that guy wise off to both of the pin 8's of the 6L6's and that is where they're measuring their bias. Alright so here we go. I'm going to start with those output tubes. I'm going to take some solder wick and get in there and pull the old solder off of there because it's kind of gray and distorted. I need to get that out of the way so that I can clean this pin and then apply the new solder. And a lot of you guys have been asking what kind of solder do I use? Well here it is, the Kester. All right. And this is your typical 6337 mix. And this stuff I think is 30 thousandths in diameter, something like that. Anyway, good solder. You always want to use good quality stuff. You don't want to use some cheap off-brand stuff and have another bad connection. So I suspect there's a little bit of corrosion on these pins. So since I can't get in there with sandpaper, I just take an X-Acto knife, scrape it a little bit, just to make sure that any surface corrosion is gone. Okay, I would not recommend using rosin, or separate flux I should say. The solder itself, if it's good quality, already has rosin in it. Okay, Just make sure to heat the connection thoroughly. Watch the solder. You see it moving? So there is the pin 8 completed. Now I did this with it tipped so you guys could see it, but now for the rest of them I need to set this chassis up horizontally. I'm going to touch up all the pins on both of these and then of course address all those other issues I was showing you. So I'm going to hit the dry connections first, right on the top of the board. Just going to flow new solder in those, because those are gimmies. So yeah, it may not be required, but when I see a dual sided circuit board with the lead just going down to a hole, I'm not very comfortable with that, especially if you look around and you see that all the other connections have the solder that flowed up so that's some inconsistency. All right, now I'm going to take care of R8 with the dry side over here and over here we had the old prostate connection. So heat that guy up get that solder to flow up onto the lead and there she is. Alright, still soldering it away. You guys know that when I'm in here working in the shop, I'm always listening to the new CD, right? So the new CD this week was actually supplied to me by a friend. It's her first CD. This is Megan Happel. She's got a website. You guys need to check this gal out. She's going to hit it big. And she signed it. How cool is that?
So I've touched up all the solder connections and inspected them under a lighted magnifying glass. Everything looks good. So the next step will be fire it up and adjust the bias. So earlier I told you about this bias circuit board here with the adjustment on the back and the test points. However, if you look at the schematic, you will not see this bias board on the schematic. I don't know why it was left off. So here, I'm going to cut to the original schematic that I found online. You'll see that they call this out as the Sobtech MiG-50 amplifier. However, it is identical to this Electroharmonix, okay? So since the schematic left out that information, I decided to go in here, reverse engineer the uh, circuit board, and add that information into the schematic. So here is the revised schematic. And if you look to the upper right, you will see where I circled by the output tubes and I added the one ohm resistor and the test points. So that you can see that the current is sampled across the one ohm resistor and the two pin eights of the 6L6s are wired in parallel. Now if you look over to the bottom left, you'll see that I also circled the bias adjustment pot and the power supply that it's going to, which is around negative 74 volts is what they show. I did measure the plate voltage on these output tubes and at idle it's approximately 535 volts. Alright, well I'm getting ready to check the bias on the output tubes. What I thought was odd about this amplifier is they give you the bias test points and the adjustment pot. However, the current that you need to adjust it to is not advertised on the amp. So I got online and I thought, well, it's got to be out there, find the user manual, right? So I looked it up. It's not there. I was like, what? Why would they give a user adjustment and the test points and not tell you what to adjust it to, right? So I found some forums where a lot of people are talking about this. And it seems to be like a mystery. One person said, well, I adjusted it to 23 millivolts, which is supposed to be 23 milliamps, right? But remember, that current is going up and dividing to the two tubes. So if you set it at 23 millivolts, you're only biasing your tubes like at 11 and a half milliamps a piece. So you know that's not right for 6L6s. So in the forums, I found a reference from Electroharmonix and it said here's our address to our techs. Email them and they'll send you the instructions. I did it and I thought these guys aren't going to answer me. Boom! Next day I had an email. So here is the information. Alright so as I stated this is your bias adjustment area here which I think is really cool that they did this. Plus they have a fuse that protects these tubes in case something goes wacko right? So here is the new diagram. I'm going to post that right now. And you can see a close-up of the bias area that you're measuring with these test points. And there in print is the factory instructions of how to set the bias on this amp. Very clear. You should have no issues doing this. Just make sure that you have a dummy load hooked up to the amp or the speakers when you're adjusting the bias. So I flipped down the power switch, the amp is warmed up. Now I have not adjusted this bias. This is as I got the amp after the owner replaced all the tubes. Okay, so the tubes are all new. Got my meter set up to the bias test points and I'm set at 200 millivolts full scale and I have a dummy load right here to simulate the speaker. So let's turn on the standby. There's our bias. Now if you look at those uh, instructions that I posted earlier, you'll see that they say it should be approximately 62 milliamps when you're done. But they say to initially set it at 60. So we'll see if we can get there. Remember this is a pretty touchy adjustment, okay? So don't crank on it. And when you're doing this, I would highly suggest that you turn off the lights. Okay, which I'll do while I'm sitting here idling. And keep an eye on your output tubes, okay? If you start seeing like a red area here or something, shut her off because you got something wrong, all right? 
The other thing is, is when you're adjusting this bias, this should be fairly stable. If it's dancing around a lot, that's an indication of a bad connection or perhaps a bad tube. Okay? It should come up, it should hold steady, and she should idle at that current. You can see we have a little bit of fluctuation, but that's to be expected. I'm in the millivolt scale, so it's very sensitive. So according to their instructions, set it at 60. You're going to let it sit for a few minutes, and then they want you to tweak it up to about 62 to 65, something like that. So this thing's biasing right up. Should be good to go. All right, so that's a wrap on the old MIG-50 repair and bias adjustment. Now that information is not readily available out there on the web. I wouldn't listen to all that hocus pocus that you're seeing on the forums. That document that I showed you is from the Tech Center. So if you would like a hard copy of it, email me and I'll send you the JPEG because I put it in a picture to make it easy to put it on the video, right? So I have it available. And the other thing I wanted to bring up is see this cool shirt with Godzilla. I've always been a big Godzilla nut. You remember the old movies when he was like, like crashing through the city in his rubber suit, smashing on cardboard buildings? Well, the new movie is like super cool. So my son got me this shirt and I got another shirt for my birthday that I want to show you. All right, so as you know, other than guitar amps, I also enjoy working on the old tube type ham transmitters especially the Johnson lines. We've got a Valiant and a Ranger back here. Well, one of my ham buddies who watches me on YouTube really appreciates that, so he thought he would send me something that I could wear at swap meets, some good old ham radio attire. So the guy is Bert, B-E-3-Y-T. He sent me this in the mail with a letter. He said, Terry, feature this in your next video. So here it is, guys, my new T-shirt. Look at there. It's just about transmitters. Hope you enjoyed the video.